What is going on? It's Alex coming back at you with another video. And today we are breaking down the Draft Network's brand new 2025 NFL mock draft. If you are new, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. You guys know how to use YouTube. Below my face is my board. It is consistently changing. The more players we watch, the more players we update. So stay tuned for that. It's a nice little sub-series that you guys can watch during these uh, during these videos. But let's get on into this. Use that link tree to go anywhere else. I post all the time on Twitter, including all 22 clips that end up supporting the decisions that I do make in the comments I make on the show. So it's absolutely free. Go and do that. And then, of course, if you guys want to get a little bit exciting, you guys can end up using the uh, underdog code, which is the top link on the link tree where you get up to $1,000 free. And then it ends up sending me 60 bucks. So much love there. Let's get on into this. Starting out with the number one overall selection, we got Daniel Harms here. You know, um, we're going to be seeing if we could do something with the draft network in 2025. I'm excited about that, but um, that's going to be something we're tabling for then. So I do like being able to highlight as much of their stuff as possible for the time being, because I think it's fair. If they're going to be judging my work, I can judge theirs. So uh, it's all iron sharpens iron. You guys know the deal. But the first pick is Travis Hunter to the Patriots. You know, I don't know. Like, I love Travis Hunter. Love him to death. Not saying he's not worth the number one pick. I took him myself in a uh, very recent mock draft. So again, want to put that out there, big asterisk. But for the Patriots, like I'm trying to think of the role Travis Hunter would play. And I personally have a ton of faith in the growth potential of Javon Baker. I love the role of Pop Douglas. And even to a point, Jalen Polk, they're not gonna give up on him. He's an early second round pick. So I don't know if the relative, like I don't think that the pie chart has enough of room for Travis Hunter on the offensive side to be able to take enough of it. Um, that being said, he could also technically have a hybrid role. It's very difficult in the NFL, but he would have a diminished role on both sides of the ball. I would just say, you know, great player. It's just, I don't know where he's going to serve and what role he's going to serve in the offense. Number two, we got Jacksonville going uh, Arianti Ursary. You know what? It's a pick that I made in my most recent collaboration mock draft with Devin Jackson of the Philadelphia Inquirer. Love Devin. He's a great guy, great friend of the show. And um, I did this at five and I was like, dude, this is pretty damn ballsy. But um, Ursary's coming off a pretty poor week. I know that this was dropped today. So most likely it will, it was probably like slightly modified after this most uh, recent week's game. So we'll see how Ursary ended up responding there. But, you know, the Jaguars could be in a position where you kick him to guard short term and have him be that long term answer at tackle. At number two, I'm not fully there yet. Again, you get to see my board. You get to see which offensive lineman that I do favor the most. Then you got the Saints going Kelvin Banks. Very interesting. Um, you're probably going to be having to kick Fuaga back to right tackle. Um, I, I don't I wouldn't really do that necessarily. But Kelvin Banks having his own respective question marks. I don't really think that it's the best idea to move him to right tackle. I know Field Yates, who loves Kelvin Banks, will think differently. And that's what makes this whole entire sports media uh, such a cool industry because, you know, we all watch the same tape. We all come away with very differing conclusions. And, you know, there's not really one person who's really gotten this fully right so far, which is kind of crazy. Like, I mean, it's understandable, but think about it. Guys have been doing this for 40 years now, and um, they still have their respective slip ups. It's honestly pretty damn awesome. And it allows for growth of people like you and myself to be able to like really dig in and have our own unique opinions that aren't just completely thrown out the window the moment Mel Kuyper says something. And I love Mel. And Mel has a lot more weight than anything I could ever say and anything you could ever say. But sometimes maybe Mel says something wrong and then you believe something that's right. And then you know what? There's that opportunity. And so it's nice to know that there's not really a gospel written, so to speak. So that's why you can have disagreements without necessarily saying one person's right over the other. We just have our reasoning. Uh, Kelvin Banks, I'm not fully sold on him. Some other people are. I'm not a big fan of the fact that a six foot four tackle that we already have questions on would then be moving to a new position. I think that when you're talking about position changes, very rarely am I in big support of it unless the question marks are kind of already checked off and it's kind of like more best player available, which uh, as much as I love offensive line, do not think that it is the best player available. At number four, you got the Panthers going Cam Ward. You know, I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility. It's tough to admit that they're going to give up on Bryce, but again, new quarterback might want his uh, or new coach, excuse me, might want his new quarterback. Uh, Cam Ward brings a ton of that upper end arm talent to the table. I don't disagree. 
He's um he is my QB one. If I'm not mistaken, I'm 99.9% sure he is. And um, you know, I just don't really have any quarterback that's I would drop in day one and feel really confident that they're going to perform well unless they're in a respective system that gives them the best opportunity to play well, which, you know, to a degree is true of every quarterback. But I don't think these quarterbacks are independent of a system. Like they're not going to be able to perform perfectly independent of a system. And again, perfectly is a big loaded term, but I think that you can't just drop them, say, okay, Cam Ward's going to succeed. I'm going to drop him. Oh, he went to that team. Okay. He's going to succeed. Right? Like there's a very, very big discrepancy. I think Canales might be a good spot for Cam Ward to go though, because Canales has shown time and time again to be able to work with quarterbacks. And even Bryce is having a much better year than before. So keep that in mind as well. Could end up working out. And then you got the Browns going Shadur Sanders at pick number five. I, again, like I think this is I think Stefanski and Sedan and Sanders could work very well together. We'll see if it ends up being something that Daddy Sanders is going to be uh, not too happy about. But you know, for the time being, I especially since I was praying to God James Winston could finally put it all together. I mean, we saw that game versus the Ravens. It's like, wow, look at this. And then it's back to Jameis. So I'm like, fuck. So it is what it is. Browns are probably going to be going to QB. And it's not be, I'm, I'm in no way am I meaning for that portion of like the ugh, part for Shadur Sanders. Like take Shadur out of this. It's the idea of a quarterback for the Browns when you have so much money tied up in Deshaun and you just can't really have a legitimately affordable option in a class that, I mean, you could bring back Flacco if you want, but it's like how many more years until the wheels have completely rusted and fallen off, right? But for the Browns, it's just top five pick in a class that I do not have full faith in one of the quarterbacks. It's just like, man, you're asking for the Cleveland Browns to continue the cycle they're at. But they are a really solid team. It is what it is. I would consider actually Will Campbell at this spot because that left tackle spot still needs some help. Raiders and go Abdul Carter. It's not out of the realm of possibility. Again, you talk about Koontz and Chase on being free agents this year. Tyree Wilson hasn't stepped up. Um, the Raiders might just want to get somebody across from Max that has that same level of enthusiasm and upside. Would not fully blame them. It would be a really unique pick because I've never seen that before. But if it does happen, you're getting a very high value position with a very high value player. I'm going to support it. The Giants go T-Mac at number seven. Continue to take the pressure off of neighbors being the only one who could truly contribute as a top tier playmaker. I'm not going to disagree with this. I go wide receiver myself for the Giants in round two, usually with um, Elik Iomainer. So I'm going to be fine with that. Then we have the Dolphins going Mason Graham at eight. If he's there, that's the pick that I make every single time. Get some help on that defensive interior and then call it a day. The Titans go Nick Scorton at nine. It doesn't really fit the style of edge rusher they've drafted before. I think James Pierce is a little bit closer to that, but... Nick Scorton's been on a tear, man. Good for him. I Technically, tear is a little bit of a loaded term. The LSU game gave him a lot of momentum this past week. I think he had three or four pressures, as well as a couple of defensive stops, which is still solid, but um, nothing unbelievable. But he is 20 years old. He's at a system that, you know, is pretty dysfunctional when it comes to, you know, how they develop their NFL-level talent. Like, there's a lot of guys who have a lot of untapped potential there because Texas A&M just doesn't develop develop them properly. Think of LT Overton having a massive surge this year. It does make me wonder why certain prospects go to Texas A&M because as a Steelers fan, I'm still praying for DeMarvin Leal to break out and we all know he definitely could have if maybe he went to a better spot. But I digress. The Jets then go Malachi Starks at 10. They definitely need to continue repairing that secondary. I personally would go after... You know, Will Johnson at this point, he is up to date, by the way. I do think he's a fantastic player. Doesn't really have that um, top tier athleticism this year because of all the issues he's been dealing with, especially with his knee. But I mean, still one of the best players I've ever studied. And you have the Cowboys going Kyron Lacey at 11. I go wide receiver for the Cowboys. So let's focus on that. That alone is um, something I can support. Kyron Lacey, though, I love the guy. I do. Like Kyron Lacey was a guy that I had in my top 20 receivers coming into the year. And you guys know I graded 57, right? The more you like, it's quite insane. And also we got a friend of the show sighting down there at 13. We'll talk about that in a minute, but it's honestly unbelievable. The more that you expand your vision and you start looking at every receiver, the more diluted it becomes in terms of talent. Like you might say, oh man, Kyron's like my wide receiver 20. And everyone's like, oh. 
what? How can you disrespect him like that? And then you name off a bunch of receivers that people haven't seen yet that you just fell in love with. Like for me, I was wrong about Antonio Gates Jr. I mean, you look at the few reps that he had last year versus Michigan, and he looked like a super stud. Don't know what the hell is going on there, but hoping that changes in time. But there's just players like that that you just fall in love with. Jaden Higgins, for example, that can really dilute when you end up saying, oh, wide receiver 20. Usually that's a bad thing. But for Kyron, it was a very good thing. I still am fully not in favor of him going in round number one. I would say late second, the earliest. But, I mean, getting the Cowboys a weapon, not going to disagree. Then we have the Bengals going Jalen Walker here. A very unique build for Cincinnati to try to address the edge. If you honestly swapped Jalen Walker and Nick Scorton, I honestly wouldn't have very many issues with this mock draft at all outside of Kyron Lacey. But again, we all have our unique opinions. It's so far away from the draft. Who knows, Kyron Lacey might end up continuing to heat up. And, you know, for someone like me who had Jaden Higgins as wide receiver one, who the hell am I? To judge somebody else's top wide receivers so it is what it is then we have at number 13 the seahawks go friend of the show marcus bow uh, marcus has been doing a lot better he had that slip up week a couple weeks ago so it's good to see him finally bouncing back had only one pressure allowed this week the whole entire purdue offensive line performed really well the left tackle actually had a 92 pass blocking grade so you know purdue's finally starting to pick up some momentum again i love to see that uh, the issue for me, I love Marcus again. I want to emphasize this with all my heart. I think he's a guard at the next level. I really do. There was something that when I ended up watching him, I'm forgetting which game that I'm specifically quoting from, but it just, it clicked to me that I was like, man, I just don't see this guy lining up from across Nick Bosa, Max Crosby, and then holding up. And he's a fantastic player. It's just the arm length issues I think are pretty apparent. And it's like, man, I I saw a tight end line up next to him a couple times, and this is a relative litmus test. But when you see how, like, whether a, a tackle is more comfortable or not with another player next to them will indicate to you whether they belong as a guard or a tackle. Now, it's not like 100% science, but you can end up looking at somebody, and just like if you're looking at me and I look all stressed, you start feeling a little bit more anxiety. You can sense that as well when players are blocking. Some guys are like just like this when they're blocking. It's like, dude relax right like like make sure your mind is clear you don't need to be a ball of anxiety the whole time and some guys are more like this and then when there's a tight end next to them they're like this and they're a lot more efficient not saying that's what marcus bow does but that's an extreme example to show you why sometimes i see tackles much better as guards and um to be honest for jordan morgan so far that's worked so it's a working method but marcus bow i think would be a guard i think he'd work well for the seahawks it's just the question is are you spending the number 13 pick on a guard and based on him being labeled as a tackle i don't think so pick number 14 for the colts they go will johnson amazing selection he'd probably slip here because of injury concerns maybe there are some medicals that pop out on him speaking of injury concerns someone who's out for the year with a hip injury is ben morrison going to the rams at 15 the rams snipe a super stud i think this is perfectly fine unless they want to go josh simmons i prefer left tackle but i do have ben morrison technically one spot higher then you got the buccaneers going mikhail williams I think it's perfectly fine. Uh, you know, you're going to be replacing Joe Tryon and Shoyinka. Mikel has a very, very, very strong foundation of athleticism, size, and length. And then you can continue building on from there. The Niners go Walter Nolan at 17. I prefer to look at the edge rushing crew still. There's a ton of edge rushers that are still very capable and very uh, ready to be able to be moved in. But, you know, if you want to really focus on the interior of the defensive line, not many have performed uh, better than Walter Nolan. Then we got 18, the Bears go Will Campbell. I think this would be an absolute home run for the Bears. I think if Will Campbell slips to 18, then there's some definite questions that you guys start asking about why maybe we can see another offseason bid with uh, one of the teams like the Giants this year where you end up seeing their draft board with like the color coding for uh, players who have like injury concerns. Maybe that would end up being the reason he could slip to 18. Besides that, I'm not fully sure. So... Keep that in mind, but I do think if the Bears get Will Campbell, he could play guard or tackle, and I think both those roles will certainly be open. The Broncos then select Ashton Genty. I personally think he'll be going the top 10. Not many running backs perform remotely as talent as well as he does, and he's like multiple tiers above any other running back in this class. It is not even funny. He is really that special of a player, so I don't really think that we need to uh, 
sugarcoat it too much. The NFL, regardless of what you think running back value is, like the NFL will value running backs, especially this high. Jameer Gibbs almost went in number six overall. Not saying that's a bad thing for Jameer Gibbs, but I'm saying in reality, that draft could have been number six, Jameer Gibbs, number eight with Bajon Robinson. I just want to put that out there. That almost happened. So, I mean, what did happen is eight and 12, right? So it's the NFL is very willing to take a running back in the top 10. And when Ashton Genty is a true three down back, the only reason he'd slip here is in case the medicals come back negative. At 20, they got the Cardinals going Kenneth Grant at 20. I already said that, but, um, you know, going defensive interior is perfectly fine for the Cardinals. I'd prefer to go after James Pierce again, but, you know, DI, Edge, that's where you should rock. 21, we for the Los Angeles Chargers, they go Donovan Jackson, who just played his first game at left tackle and got a zero pass blocking grade, just a flat zero. But um, I love Donovan Jackson. I have him listed as offensive line here. I still think he can improve. Obviously, he went up against literally someone who I have two spots higher, or sorry, Donovan's at 10, someone who's four spots higher th than him at edge, a full-time edge right now. He got moved from left guard to left tackle, and that was his first experience. Like, you got to give him some slack, but you can't give him too much slack to where a zero grade is going to be, you know, acceptable. So I think if the Chargers, like, I, I'm very surprised that they would have to go guard this early, but um, I think there's a lot of other positions you should address. Bottom line, I'll leave it there. But Donovan Jackson, hello. Uh, Donovan Jackson is a great player. I just don't really think the Rams are, or the Chargers, excuse me, are the team for him. Princely Umami Ellen going in the first round. I really want to root for him. Like Princely has been doing a great job and, you know, it is a position. It's a player that can fit for sure. It's a good fit. I just don't think that the off the line explosiveness really pops up enough in a very, very, very tempo based, very time based NFL where the time, excuse me, the time to throw is much lower. I don't think this will work as a first rounder, right? This is someone where you get them in the second and you say, hey, we're going to work on this because everything else in your game has a ton of unlockable potential that is already working in college, but at the NFL level, we need you to get this. I don't think that's a first round type of uh, type of concern to have. It's more of a day two guy. Oh, my guy. This is the second mock draft I've seen Azariah Thomas in. Y'all know, if you go back to the OG videos of the year, Azariah Thomas has been sitting in my top 20 the whole time. This has been a my guy. Um, pretty crazy to see him here. So Green Bay takes him at 23. And this dude's a stud, man. I reevaluated him, and you know what? I think he even raised up higher on my board. Well, he's like he's been around this spot the whole time. So I'm not gonna say like uh, comparisons to Thief of Joy, right? He's been a top 20 player for me um, since the beginning. He's somebody who I fell in love with. He had 500 reps last year as a backup. Like Florida State knows how to keep their dudes in rotation. Shout out to them for doing that. But um, this is perfect for Jeff Halfley, by the way. Press man physical unbelievably fast you're not toasting this dude over the top maybe unless you're Tyreek Hill so um that'd be a great pick for the Packers honestly it's a it's a beautiful thing to see then you got the Ravens going Jonas Savania I'm fine with it it's a guy who has tackle upside they're gonna be putting to guard or center technically you could put him there but you're not gonna do that if you're the Ravens but again just keep that in mind then you got the Texans going Tyler Booker their guard play has been atrocious uh, I saw Kendrick Green came in for Kenyon Green and both of them kind of sucked so uh, Kenyon Green, I think, is out for the year with an Achilles. Not going to talk bad about him. We'll just say the left guard spot needs an improvement. And at 26, Tyleek Williams goes to the Vikings. I think that's a fair position to address, especially with the run-stuffing ability of Tyleek. Ends up just continuing to allow everybody else to kind of shine, which, you know, you kind of want some flash from your first-round pick. But Tyleek Williams is that guy who's not very flashy, but will end up making everyone else around him better. And I love that. Sometimes a contributor or someone who is more who allows opportunities for others is a better pick than someone who gets solely opportunities for themselves. Then you got the Eagles going Colson Loveland at 27. Colson Loveland's a great addition for the Eagles. I think they do need to go after a tight end. Goddard's not super young. They've drafted um, tight ends every single time. Their past few tight ends have turned 28 years old. They've drafted them and Goddard's turning 30 next year. It's time. It's time to get that actual guy in there. You can't have Ben Van Sumeren taking legitimate fullback slash H back slash tight end reps. Like I love the guy, but you cannot have him being a legitimate tight end two pretty much for your team. And 
I mean, I love Grant Calcaterra, but Grant Calcaterra is very role specific in my opinion. So continuing on, we got the Steelers going Emeka Abuka. I'm fine with it. It's just he he thrives in the slot, man. And now we have Calvin Austin, Roman Wilson, and Emeka Abuka. Just something to think about. If you truly believe Emeka can play on the boundary, which I do, then this will make sense. But I don't think we've seen a first rounder from Emeka Abuka on the boundary because he hasn't played in two years. So keep that in mind as well. Commanders go Luther Burden. Luther Burden's going to be a stud if he goes to the Commanders. Really good relief for uh, Jaden Daniels, who's been pretty much pinpoint accurate to this point. But, you know, it just kind of allows a shorter range guy who's great after the catch. Uh, this is closer to where I have Luther Burden, but Luther Burden's a great player. I don't think he slips to this point, but we'll leave it there. The Bills then go Kevin Winston Jr. at 30. He's been hurt. I'm trying to remember when he's going to be coming back, but um, if he ends up having a really good end of the year and maybe he's just sitting out to make sure he's fully healthy, then, you know, I don't think this is out of the realm of possibility. The Lions snag James Pierce doesn't really fit the profile that they're trying to go for to replace Marcus Davenport. However, sometimes you just got to go best player available. I'm not going to shame it. And then ending off this draft, you get the Chiefs going to Cario Davis. Takario is very super high IQ. I think that I understand where they're trying to go with this, but Takario has just not been himself this year. Personally, I'd recommend Takario to transfer and just go back to school because I think he can end up really pushing himself to a top 10 pick. If he ends up really refining his game with a top defensive back coach that really does have pretty much his best interest in mind to polish him as much as he can, then I think that he easily, if he just gets... 10% better at changing directions and being in a system that truly allows him to thrive without having to worry about being beat with the long speed game, then I think he could truly thrive. I really do. So that's just something personally for me as someone who I'd love to carry Davis coming into the year. I really want to say on his behalf, don't come out this year because you're going to be a late day one, day two pick. And this is a guy who's meant to be a top 10 player if he refines his game. This year has been a down year for him. For the teams in the NFL, if he comes out, do a great job and buy stock low. You can put him around, see where he's at. But for Takeo Davis specifically, um, try to sell him when your stock's high. And I don't think that's right now. But that's going to be the video. I love you. See you on the far side. Thank you so much for watching. Peace.